what I'm going to talk about today is the research area that I'm in, which used to be called operating systems research, um, and properly now really is just systems research in general, because a lot of what we do does not stop at the boundaries of an operating system, but expands the sort of the boundaries of the uh, internet and perhaps the universe once our internet gets big enough. So the first question you might have is, uh, and this is certainly a question I had when I was an undergraduate, is what exactly is systems research? Like, aren't operating systems just big programs? Isn't it just engineering to build an operating system? And to sort of claim that this is, in fact, a bona fide research area, I'm going to go back in history to sort of the, the origin of operating systems to explain what is it that sort of takes research in building an operating system. So one of the first people to sort of actually think about how to build an operating system versus building one without thinking was Edgar Dijkstra. He built an early system called THD, uh, which to some extent I think is one of the worst names ever for a system because you cannot Google for it. Uh, that wasn't his problem back in 1953, fortunately. But what he identified as kind of the simple problem is in those days you had to worry about sort of correctness. People's operating systems were crashing all the time. And he realized that getting a really complex piece of code to work well was very difficult and that inherently there is this sort of this challenge of an operating system manages multiple things happening at once. You've got multiple programs running that want to use your hardware. You have multiple devices, such as a printer in those days, a keyboard, a hard drive or something, a network. They all want access to the hardware also. How do you sort of uh, arrange and synchronize between these things? And he invented semaphores, which may have been the bane of your undergraduate operating systems course, which is certainly the case here. Uh, but nonetheless, a very you know, interesting and novel solution. Um, so to more recently, um, there's a guy named Butler Lamson who works at Microsoft now. Um, and he wrote a paper in the 80s sort of talking about what is sort of the intellectual challenge in building operating systems. And he said that it's very different to build an operating system or a computer system than writing an algorithm. Because your external interface is much broader. You've got you know, hundreds to thousands of APIs. You have all kinds of unspecified behaviors on them. Um, you have a lot more internal structure. If you look at the inside of an operating system, you have maybe a million lines of code and 30 to 40 subsystems that have to interact in very complex ways. So it's sort of a, a study in complexity to some extent. And the question of success is a lot less clear. How do you say if an operating system is good? Would we even say the operating systems today we have are successful from a, a metric of are they good? They certainly work well enough, but it's not clear that they're good operating systems at this point. And one of the things he talked about is sort of the need for abstraction. How do we take these complex problems, present simple abstractions that people can work against? So for example, files. We have this very complex set of devices we use to store data, but as a programmer or a user, you get a file, which is a very nice, easy thing to understand. And for that, you can thank operating systems researchers. And that wasn't the end of their invention. Uh, you might have used a phone recently that runs iOS. iOS is uh, sort of an, a, uh, an ancestor, but is descended from the original version of Unix written at Bell Labs, developed by systems researchers, and really sort of a study of how do you design an operating system to sort of be small and compact and have a reasonable set of abstractions and how to be portable to multiple systems. Uh, more recently in the 90s, we had the rise of distributed systems. Network Appliance was a startup company that wanted to know how do we build high performance storage systems that we can put on a network and share? How do we share data across computers so we can access a common data set? How do we make it reliable? We know that disks fail. You know, your average disk fails once every year or two. If we've got a thousand disks, we have a lot of failures. So how do we build something that can survive all those failures? And if we have a common file system, we're going to want a lot of users. So how do we handle hundreds of thousands of users? Moving on, there's been some other notable successes. Um, the Zen project, which was done at Cambridge in the systems research community, became the basis for cloud computing at Amazon um, and their EC2 project. Um, VMware was spun out of uh, research on virtual machines at Stanford and became you know, another basis for cloud computing and for virtualization. Um, and the idea here is really, if we're going to run an operating system, we can basically simulate the hardware and run multiple operating systems on the same piece of hardware, and then we can either choose to run Linux on top of Windows or vice versa, or we can run multiple copies of the same operating system on one piece of hardware. So again, moving forward another five years or so, we have another really interesting systems problem, which is how do we handle scale? If we want to build internet services, we have to be able to serve the entire population of Earth 
uh, and perhaps the entire animal population of Earth, which gets a lot larger. So we need to think about how do we handle thousands of machines working together. So Google did a lot of interesting work in this area, first with the Google file system, which said, how do we manage data? When we want to put it on a thousand machines and access it quickly, what is the right way to structure that? And later with MapReduce, which really answers the problem, how do we do something interesting with that data? How do we analyze it and understand the contents of that data and harness the power of a thousand machines and maybe 10,000 hard disks to do this? So this was all history. You might ask, you know, that was the, the 2000s. Um, there's actually a famous systems researcher who said operating systems research is dead right around 2003. He now works for Google. So clearly somebody thought there was a, a future for him. But the thing that's interesting now is to sort of think about, is to sort of look at what is changing. So systems really lives in the middle of the stack. Uh, it sits above hardware and it sits below applications. And what that means is whenever there's a change at either of those levels, the system software gets to respond. So at the hardware level, we have new kinds of hardware. We have new ways of doing computation with things like tensor processing units for doing machine learning, GPUs for doing graphics and machine learning and all kinds of acceleration. We have new applications such as big data analytics using Spark or deep neural networking. Apologies for the flaky presentation we see. Okay, it's coming back. So when there are new applications, there are new needs for the operating system and the system software to respond. Because what these need is very, what these programs need are very different than what prior programs needed. So systems researchers get to go in and think about how can we make these systems scale to much larger clusters of computers? How can we make them run much, much faster? So let me introduce the systems research group here at UW. Um, Aditya Kayla does a lot of networking and systems research looking at big data systems and machine learning. Andre and Rosemary Pachu So um, work together on most of their work, and they do a lot of work on storage systems and also on serverless computing. Um, Bart Miller does a lot of work on supercomputing and also on uh, trustworthy computing, computer security, and analysis of malware. Um, I do a lot of work on adapting system software for new hardware technologies. Don't mind the pink hair. That was a little thing I tried last summer. And it's likely over. Uh, you never know. Um, and then our newest professor, um, Shivaram Venkataraman, or Shiv, does a lot of work on big data systems and system software for machine learning. So what are the kinds of things our students do here? Well, you know, what they do is they write a lot of code. They run a lot of experiments. Um, and they publish a lot of papers. So some recent work that's been published, um, there's some work on uh, sort of recovery for consensus-based storage. You want to build a distributed storage system that is highly reliable. When things fail, how do you actually make sure that uh, your system gets up and running again? Um, in terms of um, new memory technology, there's some work that my students did looking at how future non-volatile memory technologies are actually going to be used, what we need from software to support that. Um, there's also been some work on looking at sort of crash vulnerabilities. So you're building a big distributed system. You've got lots of machines out there running. What happens if multiple machines fail at once? Is it likely they'll fail at once? Most people build software saying, I can handle one failure, two failure, but if, you know, five failures, my system falls over. What if you have the same bug in all your code and all five fail at once? How do we sort of reason about that, uh, detect problems like this and fix them? So, as grad students, you probably don't want to spend the rest of your life uh, in our department. Um, it is a good place. We like having people here. We also like when you leave um, and go on and do new things and report back and tell us. So we've had a lot of grad students in the systems area. They've gone a lot of different places. Um, some people really love living in universities, and so they go to some other university. Um, Vijay Chidamaram is now at the University of Texas. Meeting John was at Purdue and just moved to UCSD for better weather. Um, Theo Benson, not me Benson, my apology, um, was at Duke University and is now at Brown University. So we certainly send people to universities. We also send a lot of people to industry, to industrial research labs, Microsoft, IBM, VMware, AMD, Intel, for people who like research but you know, aren't so interested in working with grad students um, or teaching. Certainly, every good computer company employs a lot of our graduates, both at the master's and PhD level. And then we also have people who go on to startup, who um, go on to join startups, you know, if they don't want some of the big mega company experience. 
So, what I want to do now is tell you a bit about some of the research areas that are going on. I'm not going to go through every person um, and what they do. Instead, I'm going to kind of focus on some theme areas and describe a couple of projects that are going on in those areas. Um, so I mentioned before, there's a bunch of work on big data analytics. This is largely done by Professor Aditya Kela and Shiv and Padraman. Um, and some of the things they're looking at are how do you do sort of uh, streaming analysis at scale? You've got terabytes of data that are coming in that are being generated from some system. You'd like to analyze that data as it arrives and answer some questions or produce some results. So you have to think about how do you handle all this data coming in, merging the data, combining the data, making sense of it, um, while not actually losing the data. Another thing people are looking at is what's called serverless data analytics. So there's a new move in computing called serverless computing that I'll talk about a little bit more. The idea is that you can just write a single function, give it to some cloud provider, and their job is to figure out what server to run it on, when to run the function, how to manage the data. So it's a really nice environment because you can do things like make a thousand copies of this in one second and get massive parallelism. Um, and so there's some work going on here on how do we use this for data analytics. It seems like there should be a natural fit for this environment and handling big data. It's not easy, uh, but it is possible. Another big project uh, area that's really rising in importance across all of computer science is machine learning. You've just heard a lot about machine learning. So it has infected the systems community as well. And our approach is really to say, you know, we sort of leave the algorithms of how you do machine learning to the ML people. What we want to know is, is sort of figure out how do we make it fast? How do we get the most out of the hardware and software that we have? So one thing you can do is say, well, we've got this high-speed network. Let's see if we can actually do some of our machine learning computation in the network. So for example, we can do certain kinds of aggregations on a network switch as the data is flying by 10 gigabits per second so that we don't actually have to do any processing. We don't even have to send the packets on. So we can really speed things up. Um, we also, as I mentioned before, serve, are interested in serverless computing. So there's a number of us looking at serverless computing. UW-Madison was one of the first places to create an open source uh, serverless computing platform for research called Open Lambda. And we've got a number of other efforts in the same area, looking, as I mentioned, about how to do data analytics in this area. Uh, my students in particular are looking at security for serverless. How do we make sure if you're using this platform that your data is secure, that other people are using the same platform, running their code on the same physical machines, using the same networks, can't actually steal your data in any way. Uh, another really big focus here at UW-Madison is storage systems. Um, in particular, we're um, looking at a couple of areas. One is looking at new kinds of storage technologies. So in the last 10 years, flash storage has really taken off and has completely changed everything because it's so fast. Um, and so there's a question of how do we take advantage of the speed? How do we build systems? You know, when your storage is faster than the network, you might want to think about uh, where you put it in, the, in your system or how to build faster networking. Um, another thing that's happening is there's a new kind of memory uh, coming out called non-volatile memory. It's like DRAM, it stores your data very quickly, you can access it in your program, but when you turn your power off and turn it back on a month later, all your data is there. So there's a really interesting question of how do we take advantage of this uh, new technology and make new programming models around it. Finally, we have work on supercomputing. These are you know, the largest computing, some of the largest computing systems out there. They're increasingly built from a combination of different kinds of hardware, such as FPGAs, GPUs, and CPUs. And so there's interesting questions of how do you sort of debug your program when it's running on 100,000 nodes and you've got a problem? How do you actually figure out what's going wrong? And if you've got a system like this, how do you know if there's, a, if there's some sort of poor performance happening when, it, when you have to sort of look at 100,000 machines to understand anything? So Professor Bart Miller has some students looking at sort of figuring out how to use a supercomputer and a GPU in the wrong way um, and build some tools that tell you automatically if your code has some sort of substantial performance problems that could be fixed and give you much bigger speed ups. So that is sort of a whirlwind summary of the kind of research that's going on here. Um, there's a bunch of us who will be up on the fourth, seventh floor this afternoon and we're happy to tell you more about the specific details. We will also have a number of our students in room 7331 up on the seventh floor by the elevators late this afternoon. So you can learn about what they're doing. You can get the nitty gritty details on what we are like as advisors. Um, and you can learn about why this is a great place to come. So thank you all for sticking with me and I will pass the baton on to the next presentation.